presentation that could be made. Because if there were, it could not be And I had come to an even worse conclusion. I had come to the conclusion that there was a, a deity of this world, and he was evil. And this was something I just simply could not escape from. Hey, dickheads! Like a pink laser beam of truth beaming straight from San Diego, California, straight to your brain hole! Or are we beaming straight from Millgate, Virginia? We, we are your personal dickheads. We may be trapped behind glass, but we're in battle with cosmic forces to get out in time for the end of this podcast. <laughs> oh, shit, Whoa. that was way too good for me, David. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to talk about Cosmic Puppets, but before we do, we have a few things we got to do. First off, I am David Agronoff, one of your co-hosts, and with me today is... Anthony Trevino. Anthony Trevino, that's me. And? Langhorn J. Tweed. And um, we don't... Esquire. <laughs> yeah. Wow, added an Esquire to your name? <laughs> yeah, why not? You living on that moon base with all those bougie moon people? <laughs> I'm hoping to. Yeah. I'm if they hear that Esquire part, maybe. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we are still trying to get on iTunes. Sorry, folks. Working on that. But uh, we got a bunch of stuff going on generally, but nothing that super interesting. So well, let's just get into PKD. Sick. Are, are you sick, sick intro. man? All right. All right. So there. Give me the news, David. There's actually PKD news. This what? month. Excellent. Air horn. <laughs> There's two really big pieces of PKD news. First thing is that Man in the High Castle got renewed for a fourth season. Really? I still haven't watched it. And here's the weirdest, weirdest part is that it got renewed for a fourth season, even though the third season does not even have a release date yet. So they did wrap on season three. So Amazon has seen it, ideally. And they were so happy with it, and I guess the plan for season four was good enough that they already greenlit season four, even though uh, season three is not out. So we still don't have a release date for season three, but we do know we will get a season four. Cool. So that's cool. And the next piece of really big and awesome Philip K. Dick news is that Titan Books and Alco Alcon Inter uh, Media, who owns the rights to Blade Runner, announced that they are doing comics and graphic novels set in the Blade Runner universe. Uh, that will Excellent. Yes, that will spin off from Blade Runner 2049. They're going to be edited by Titan's David Manley Leach. That's his name. And Alcon Media's Jeff Connor are going to oversee it. There was an article in Entertainment Weekly that they're going to be doing these comics. How do you guys feel about Blade Runner comics based off of 2049? I'm I'm all for it. Yeah, I think it's pretty cool, too. It depends on who they get for writers and artists, which we don't know yet, because they just introduced this this last week. So They should get Grant Morrison. Um, I'm that not guy's a psycho. He would have fit perfectly. So they're going to send all the replicants to find magician frog people? Possibly. <laughs> I don't know where this story is going to go, but... Um, to answer your question, David, I don't... Eh, I'm, I'm indifferent. Now, how would you feel if they hired us to write it? Please hire us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a great idea. <laughs> yeah. I support it fully. Um, I think that if they can give us stories that aren't just... Um, Blade Runners tracking down replicants or essentially turning it into just another kind of noir where a detective is solving a mystery and we kind of get new, unique stories from it, then that sounds interesting. But if it's just going to be the same kind of detective solves mystery, I'll be I'll be a little bored, yeah, to be okay. quite honest. Um, here's what I think would be really cool is with the... Uh, with a graphic novel, you can expand the scope in the world of Blade Runner and you can do different right. parts of the... You could even do the colonies. You could do all kinds of interesting things with yeah, I with, agree. Uh, with the story. So yeah. So if you are listening and you think, uh, well, and remember, there's there's also a revolution on the horizon in that universe. Oh, that's As far true. as the movies are concerned, so yeah. And as far as I'm concerned, that was the weakest part of the movie. 
And so Anthony would love to see a mini series about the revolution. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no. Uh, well, Larry and I can write those uh, that series, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you could uh, tweet at Titan Books and tell them you think uh, they should hire the dickheads to uh, write Blade Runner. All three of us. Yep. Yeah, we'll do it if uh, they, uh, you know, want us to. But yeah, I, I'm I'm cool with the idea of. Um, or if anybody wants to hire us to write those Predator tie-in novels, I'm you know I'm free. <laughs> yeah, free. Well, that's that's um, all you. So, yes. so here's the thing that um, I do think if they get the right writers, it could be something really cool. But um, yeah, I think so. I would love to see some like uh, classic cyberpunk authors get a chance at doing some of those uh, mm. comics. Like I'd love to see Gibson, Sterling, John Shirley. Rudy I would Rutger. love. I, I I honestly wouldn't mind a Cody Goodfellow. Yeah, Cody would do a great Blade yeah, Runner he'd series. Kill it. Yeah. Um, so it's not just us. We're saying that you know, but uh, but it's y- mostly us. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't want to hire us. Hire Cody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, friend of the show, Cody Goodfellow. We would love to see Cody write Blade Runner comics. I would really love to see, like, Rudy Rudker or John Shirley. Um, or, um, Greg Bear, who did Blood Music, which was phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. Not really cyberpunk, but still pretty phenomenal science fiction book. Yeah. So that's our dream wish list for <coughs> who could write the uh, Blade Runner comics. So, <clears throat> and graphic novel series. But we don't know a release date or anything. It was literally just announced All right. Thursday. Hey, I didn't know. For once, we had news. Oh Well, we have one other piece of Blade Runner news. Wow. Blade Runner Memory Lab. It's a 25-minute VR experience that was released last October. It has been getting a lot of buzz. And I didn't know, I didn't know about this, but um, you can play the role of a silent replicant whose job is to function as a Blade Runner. And you're going to hunt down and kill runaway replicants for the Wallace Corporation. And it's like a VR experience. You put on the goggles and that whole thing. And So so and, that must be in relation to the interactive VR experience I did last year at Comic-Con? Yeah, I think that was a preview of it. That yeah. was the best thing I've ever participated in at Comic-Con. It was fucking killer. The VR part was pretty cool, but then once you take the VR headset off, the screen uh, opens in your in. 2049 LA. Oh, you mean at Comic Con? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. It was awesome. Yeah, yeah where they, they had all the like bars and restaurants set yeah, up. Yeah, and, and it was they it served, was raining inside. And they right. served noodles. Yeah, we got there. we got whiskey noodles and hung out and got our pictures taken. It was awesome. It was really cool. That was the coolest thing I've done at Comic Con, and I've been going since I was 13, so quite a long time. Well, Comic Con starts Wednesday, right? Yeah, yeah, I'll be there Friday and Saturday. Um, That's a I'm big gonna, announcement. Yeah, yeah, I'll be if there. If you're coming to Comic Con, you can meet Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the, the the thing everyone wanted to, do. Uh, you know, and we'll release this episode so, two weeks after sure, Comic Con's sure. happened. That's true. Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna just be there Saturday. But um, Wait, you have an all week badge. Why are you only going Saturday? Let's talk about that off air. All right. So I maybe there are other days. I'm not sure. Roger that. Saturday is the only day I'm guaranteeing. I'm going to be there. The you, day. too, could meet David. And if you go on Saturday, you could meet me and David. Wow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and possibly Cody, right? He's usually there doing something weird. He's a, he's there all the time. Hey, that's how David and I met. Have we talked about how we met on this podcast, David? Uh, I, I haven't heard that story. You haven't heard that story? No. Uh, uh, well, yeah, people might think this was funny. So Anthony and I met because uh, we were counter-protesting the Westboro, Westboro Baptist Church religious assholes in favor of Cthulhu. <laughs> um, yeah, so Cody Goodfellow is, uh, uh, for the second time I'm going to say it, a friend of the podcast, was doing this kind of funny counter-protest to the to the God's hate, God hates fags people at Comic Con, where he like had a bullhorn and signs about a like, lobster pope hat. Yeah, like basically protesting in favor of the Lovecraftian gods. And he needed two cultists. And so I was one of the people that Cody called on, and you were one of the other people. And so the first time Anthony and I ever met each other, we were both protesting in favor of Cthulhu. Yep, nice. So. Because Cody needed his biggest fan. And his favorite fan <laughs> in the same place. Right. So, yeah, it was kind of a funny way to meet somebody. 
Uh, a better first date story than most of my real first date stories. <laughs> All right, we have two more pieces of Phil K. Dick news, but um, I haven't played the VR game. What I what I understand is that it's getting out and around, and that you can can get it. So it may be something that we want to look into and have the experience, and maybe talk about it on the show. So. Sure. Yes. So this is a little one, but was interesting is there was, it didn't end up happening, but there was a lot of buzz leading up to the Emmys for Best TV Movie, the episode of Philip K. Dick's Electric Dreams, the episode The Commuter was getting a lot of buzz and people thought it was actually going to get nominated. It did not. But the fact that it was getting discussed, I thought was really interesting because... You know, it just shows that there was a lot of respect for that series, even though it was limited and, and, uh, but it was getting Emmy buzz. So I thought that was cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And this is an interesting one because this is, this is not really kind of directly Philip K. Dick related, but, um, when I was Google searching Philip K. Dick news, I kept seeing things about the new documentary, Three Identical Strangers. And, and, At least four or five articles that I looked at about the movie, they compared it to this documentary being like a Philip K. Dick novel. And I just noticed that it happened several times in these articles. So I went to see Three Identical Strangers just because I was like, well, you know, is this, why do they keep comparing it to Philip K. Dick? And I get it. It's not as, you know, what happened to these three the movie's about three triplets that were separated at birth and adopted out to different families, and they didn't know that they were triplets. I, I know, and now I know what you're talking about. Right, and the one, they ended up at the same college and found oh, out... Oh, right, yeah, I heard about that. Yeah, and if you consider that Philip K. Dick, I don't know that the people who did, said this in the article realized that Philip K. Dick was a twin and that his sister died when he was really young, and so he was obsessed with the idea of this phantom twin of his that he never had. So I don't think that's what they meant. I think they meant more the idea that, like, what would it be? It would be like a total mind fuck to find out that there was another version of you and then there were two versions of you. But the second half of the movie gets into some really weird stuff because you find out that they were actually separated on purpose by people who were experimenting on them. Mm. And I'm not going to go too much further into that, but it is worth seeing. I would wait till video, unless you have Movie Pass, which is how I saw it. With Movie Pass, it didn't cost me anything, so it was worth seeing. And people keep saying it's uh, life is stranger than fiction, but it's definitely not stranger. Which it's not. <laughs> yeah, it's not stranger than 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 um, Philip K. Dick, but uh, I definitely see the comparison. So. Anyways, do you guys have any other news items or? Not that I'm aware of. I don't have any news. Okay. So, next up is Dick Like Suggestions. Uh, does anyone want to go? Larry, do you want to go first? Get well, it, Larry. Yeah, I'll, I'll go first because we've been talking a lot about Blade Runner, and my suggestion is an old Blade Runner game, oh. which it's Dick Like because it's not, it doesn't follow any of <clears throat> specific uh, Android stuff, you know? What platform is it on? It's a PC game by okay. Westwood Studios. Okay. The greatest video game making studio of all time in my opinion i'll take your word for it but it follows it's an entirely different story written by other people but taking place in the blade runner universe so it kind of fits in with the comic books that are coming out and the vr experience i thought it was a it's something that people should check out did you uh have you played the game before oh yeah okay oh yeah did you play it in the past or yeah i played it a long time ago okay it came out in 1997 yeah, so, that's a long time ago. Yeah. Now, cool. That is a great dick-like suggestion. Anthony, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, so I'm going to recommend two things. One is the recent Black Mask Studios comic, Come Into Me, which is about uh, people who are connected, are sharing kind of thoughts and feelings through this weird Cronenbergian umbilical cord. And um, mm. so that's pretty cool. And then I'll also recommend Nick Cutter's The Acolyte, which is about a kind Secret of... Secret beliefs! Yes, David. <laughs> Religion! <laughs> oh, boy. Precogs! No, there's no precogs in it. But um, it's by Nick Cutter, who wrote The Troop, and most recently, I think, Little Heaven. I don't know if he's put anything else. Which was my it. horror novel of the year last year. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> 
so basically it it's it's kind of um it's it's pretty much a detective story where uh a guy who works for this the secret police for this place called New Bethlehem um they're a relig- religious police and he starts doubting his faith and kind of investigating these series of terrorist attacks that are going on throughout the city it's really cool david likes to compare it to equilibrium but um <laughs> it's way better uh yeah i read the acolyte as it well it doesn't have any gun kata no it has no gun kata um but uh, uh i read i read the acolyte too um i don't know if nick cutter is a dickhead himself if he was actually directly influenced by philip k dick he may have been influenced by things that were influenced by philip k dick um it would be interesting we should ask him um on twitter the twitters if he's a dickhead or not because this book is very very philip k dick i i i a good good job, Anthony. Good dick like suggestion. I done did a thing. Yeah. <laughs> so for my dick like suggestion this month, I'm gonna go with a contemporary of Philip K. Dick, a good friend of his, uh Norman Spinrad, who is still with us, lives in Paris uh, at the time to- at the moment. We are attempting Paris, France or Paris, California. Or Paris, Texas. Two very Par- oh, or Paris, Texas. Great movie. Right. Uh, with Henry um, Dean Stanton. He lives in the uh, country that just won the World Cup, so he lives in Paris, France. Um, I'd be sad if it was Paris, California. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I am working on trying to get Mr. Spinrad on the podcast, so if anybody out there listening can put a bug in his ear, we'd love to have him on the podcast. But he has a novel in particular called The Iron Dream Okay. that I'd like to suggest. And The Iron Dream is a science fiction novel written by a fictionalized version of Hitler yes. where where basically what happens is it the novel is about Hitler ends up not becoming the leader of Germany he ends up becoming a cartoon a cartoonist in New York and he writes this science fiction novel novel about the fourth reich and and, and his ideas of nazism so it's basically the Iron Dream is basically his is Hitler's science fiction novel about. Okay. Yeah, it is a crazy book, but it's very similar to Man in the High Castle in this in, in concept. Beyond that, I don't, I don't want to go too far. It's kind of hard book to find, but if you find it, th- there is one crazy paperback version that has like Hitler on a scooter <laughs> that looks <laughs> really crazy. Some of the covers for the Iron Dream are just amazing, but any spin rad you can read is is good. Uh, he is an, a f- phenomenal classic science fiction author. I definitely highly recommend um, Man in the High Castle, or not Man in the High. That's <laughs> duh. Men in the Jungle. Norman Spinrad's Men in the Jungle, or, or his first science fiction novel, Agent of Chaos, which are both kind of Vietnam era protest novels. And he has an amazing anarchist sci-fi novel called The Void's Captain's Tale. So, and he's been read, but specifically The Iron Dream. So Excellent. Yeah, so that's uh, Dick-like suggestions. Uh, is it time for the book? It is, well, you know. Are we going to floor it into Millgate, Virginia soon or what? Well, let's talk about 1957. Oh, yeah, Ooh. David, what was happening in 1957? <laughs> it's funny you should ask because I have some notes about that. 1957. Oh, 1957 was the year that Sputnik 1 and 2 were launched. The first human built uh, spacecraft to go into orbit. That's pretty cool. That's, that's a pretty long time ago. The most popular movie of the year, the big Oscar winner, was 12 Angry Men. <laughs> <laughs> Great Excellent. fucking movie, though. Yeah, yes. it is. The la- that year was the last episode of I Love Lucy. And one of the biggest historical events of the year was the National Guard being sent to force segregation on Little Rock, Arkansas, with the Little Rock Nine. There were nine hmm. black students who had to be given protection to actually go to school. So just to give you an idea, like when this novel came out, they were still sending National Guard to make sure that blacks and whites were forced to go forced to high school. integration. Yeah, forced integration. Yeah, excuse me. I said segregation. Forced integration. I recently heard an interview on Fresh Air with one of the Little Rock Nine, and it was fascinating. But it's just to tell you how far back this novel was. Right. You know? It's really... It was a different world. Yes. Now, it was originally written, this novel, in 1953. 
So keep that in mind. Okay. That was the year uh, Eisenhower was elected. I don't have as much on 1953. Just on the year it was, it was uh, published. So do you guys want to do writing and publication history or the story oh, yeah. first? Let's yeah. hear it. Okay, so this was the first attempt at a science fiction or fantasy novel for Philip K. Dick. Now, he at the time was calling it science fiction, but the three of us here, when we were talking about it before we started recording, we basically all agree that it's not really science fiction as much as it is a fantasy novel. The most sci-fi yeah. part about it is when they, is when they kind of bust out the the spell remover. Right. That's right. probably the most science fiction-y. <laughs> but then they use, what was it, the M something, which is the the the, the kind of the theorem for magic. Well, let's oh, not, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's not get too far ahead of ourselves, but I will say that you know, it was originally published in uh, Satellite Science Fiction, which, thanks to our MVP, Langhorn J. Tweed, we actually have a copy sitting here on the table with us of Satellite Science Fiction from 1956. When the story was originally called A Glass of Darkness, a novel of cosmic conflict. And, yeah. this and on ma- the back, the it Satellite says, Magazine is really cool looking. Yeah, because we get two free round-trip reservations to the moon, according to this. Yeah. A fucking going. Right. And it also has, now this ad on the back cover with the three, two free round trips is pretty amazing. And it has a like little like part that you can cut out. And it says for moon tour reservations. Hold, hold, hold on. Let me, let me, let me look at this. It says moon tour reservations. Please rush me two free round trip to the moon reservations. <laughs> oh, listen to this. My reservations, which will be printed on handy wallet-sized cards, will include a moon weight chart and a complete rocket ship (laughs) flight schedule for the moon, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. I will in no way be committed to make a voyage. Wow. (laughs) You guys, what a time we lived in. Yeah, you'd gotten that card and you were forced, like you couldn't not go to the moon. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Which is pretty awesome. So the magazine also has a, um, I noticed that it has an Arthur C. Clarke story in here. The, yeah, I haven't read that story yet, but the I want Relcu- to. The Reculent Orchid or something like that. Uh, I don't know any of the other, oh, it has a Gordon Dixon story in there, which is funny because uh, it, when I was younger, I always used to look for Philip K. Dick books in the bookstore, and it always annoyed me that there was, in the used bookstores, there were no Philip K. Dick books. But there was like nine bazillion Gordon Dick- Dixon yeah. <laughs> <laughs> books there, which can tell you who was the author people liked reading. Yeah, this is a really cool thing that we or that Larry has this in his possession. And of yeah, course, it, we'll, it, we'll post pictures cool. on the Instagrams. I already did. We yeah. posted pictures on the Instagrams. I did. Yeah, we both did. So um, those of us who use it, the Instagrams. So yeah, it was t- uh, under the title A Glass of Darkness, which was obviously Philip K. Dick's uh, title for the story, which we've seen a bunch of times is that pretty much besides The Man Who Japed, uh, Ace always changed the titles. Right. And I don't know, what do you think, guys, between the two titles? Which title do you do you like better? I what? like A Glass of Darkness more, but co- The Cosmic Puppets is actually more fitting for the book. I just like the way A Glass of Darkness sounds. But yeah, I think they're both good. I think uh, The Cosmic Puppets is is more uh, is more friendly, sales friendly. Yeah. It just sounds like a better story than yeah. A, a I, Glass I, of Darkness. I would disagree. Actually, I mean, having read the story, I think the Cosmic Puppets is more of what the story's about, but I think A Glass of Darkness has a nice ring to it. Well, but what is A Glass of Darkness? Well, I don't know. Not What is con- A Cosmic Puppet? Especially, well... See, A Cosmic Puppet has a much more clear that's, def- well, definition. Well, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just saying I like the way A Glass of Darkness sounds more than The Cosmic Puppets. I don't know. Don't you fucking front on me, Larry. It felt like you were disagreeing with me. I... Probably because I'm always disagreeing with you. <laughs> That's probably right. David, um, what do you like more? I prefer the title Cosmic Puppets. However, I wasn't there a Heinlein story that was called, like... The, You're thinking of the Puppet Masters. Puppet Masters? Is that what... Oh, pu- yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah, that's why I, I always got it confused with Puppet Masters and Heinlein. Not a I novel younger. I really enjoyed. Yeah, yeah, me neither. It was all, It was okay. I prefer the Cosmic Puppets. 
Wow. Oh, I don't know if I'd prefer the Cosmic Puppets over that over Heinlein's uh, Puppet Masters, but um, is it Puppet Master or Puppet Masters? Puppet, Puppet Masters. Masters. Yeah, I, I think I prefer that over this, but still not a very good book. Okay, so um, Cosmic Puppets was <laughs> first. Yeah, I know. Great transition. <laughs> Cosmic Puppets was first published as a novel by who other than Ace Books. What book was it paired with, David? It was Ace Double, Double D. <laughs> That's what they were numbered. Double, Double D. D. Wow, you guys are making titty jokes on my I, academic podcast? No, no, no. You <laughs> you made the... You're just I, mad because I, it's I not a dick it. joke. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's, that's fair. It was the Ace Double 249, <laughs> and it was do si do with Sarah Gasso of Space by Andrew... Oh. Andrew North, which was a pen name for the writer Andre Norton. I think I have that book, maybe. Yeah, Andre Norton was a very famous science fiction author, and at the time, I think she was writing under the name Andre North because it was like James Tiptree, where you know, science women science fiction writers were encouraged a lot of times to write under a male name, write a pseudonym, a male right. pseudonym. And James Tiptree, just like the Cutners. Yeah, James Tiptree. Um, I don't even know what her real name was, to be honest with you. Yeah, so Andre Norton, this was... Now, here's the interesting thing about Sarah Gasso of Space is that it was the first book of a series that became very popular, but it's a total space opera. So it's a, so a lot of the books that we've seen do si do with, with the dick books that we've read so far have been kind of similar in tone or the same kind of weird science fiction. But Saragossa of Space is, yeah, complete space opera. So I have the, the description here. Almost a half century ago, renowned science fiction and fantasy author Andre Norton introduced apprentice cargo master Dane Thorson in Saragossa of Space in the first of a star-spanning tales of the Solar Queen series. Dane signed on with the independent cargo ship Solar Queen looking for a career in off-world trade. So, that's, so space pirates. Yeah, basically. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of it, it's. But what I, I I I look forward to the Joss Whedon adapted screenplay. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, and by look forward to, I mean I don't. Yeah, I I don't. There's a lot of Andre Norton that I really do like. I have read Andre Norton that I like, but I this this one doesn't. I imagine the me. cover of that is a sweaty dude hanging out on the brig. <laughs> in space. Hanging out on the brig? Oh, touche. You know what? I see my mistake here, Larry. Thank you for the correction. Anytime, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, yeah, I'm not interested in reading that one at all. Nope. Gotta be honest with you. It's just, there's plenty of space opera out there that I do like. I'm not anti-space opera. But... Why'd you look at me when you said anti-space opera? <laughs> I'm not anti-space opera. I'm anti-space pirates. Space pirates? Okay. No, I'm kidding. I just... You know, there's a real big problem with Alien Resurrection in its space pirates. <laughs> Actually, that's not the thing that I disliked about it. Yeah, what about the Ice Pirates? That's a great movie. Mm -hmm. It has space herpes. I actually like the characters in Alien Resurrection. I, just... I need us to do a podcast all about the sexually transmitted diseases you can get in space now. By space pirates. I just put space in front of everything. Space chlamydia. <laughs> space chlamydia. <laughs> Um, I just saw the honest trailers about the Blade trilogy. Mm -hmm. where they should they cut together all the times they just put vampire in front of something. Oh yeah, that's that <laughs> vampire whiskey. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And they cut all of them together, and it's really embarrassing. I am a fan of that trilogy. I am going to watch that. Later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everybody listening, go watch the. Honest Does, do they call Triple H's Chihuahua a vampire dog? They, they something like that. They bring out the vampire dog. Yeah. Um, I do love me some Blade Trinity. Uh, I hate Why? Blade Trinity. I love that movie. God. Movie's garbage. Uh, yeah, I can't, can't do I Blade. actually, I only With really Fabio like Fabio the... as Dracula? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I like the first one quite a bit. Uh, I like the first With a midget two as the bad guy. Yeah. I like the first two Blade yeah. movies. Two's good. I love Blade 2. But anyways. Blade 2's good. On the Blade cast. I'll take, I'll take <laughs> Trinity over the first one. <laughs> oh. Uh, we've got a that's not this podcast. Anyways, um, so. we're going to start a follow podcast called Snipe Secrets, which is all the untold stories of Wesley Snipes movies no one ever knew. Ooh. 
Yeah. As long as we do a white man can't jump one. We gotta do Art of War since it's the same director as Screamers. Right? Well, yeah, is there a teddy bear at the end? (laughs) Which no one answered my question about on Twitter. All right. Anyways. Fucking teddy bear. Um... So, here's an interesting thing about Cosmic Puppets. It was out of print until 1983 from when it was from the first edition. So, it did not do well. Berkeley reissued it in 1983 with that sweet Zeus cover. Oh, is that the one I have? Yeah. Yeah. That was the 1983 reprint. Nice. That is the most confused cover. Yeah, and so I found a Philip K. Dick quote where he said, I asked Wolheim why Ace never reprinted it. And he replied, I don't even recall the story. It was not reprinted because I forgot about it. <laughs> Damn! <laughs> Damn! Dis. He, uh, Wolheim did not even remember. It wasn't even bad enough for him to remember it. It was just, but it is. It is bad enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, 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 I don't like this book. All right. Well, before we... Before we trash it? Before we trash it, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm probably actually going to be the one that, I don't know. I, You'll be the minority I, report the on this one. Yeah, I think so. Womp womp. All right, um, I saw there was an io9 article that specifically talked about the different covers of the Cosmic Puppets over the various history of it, because they were talking about how interesting the covers were for what it said about trends in science fiction and fantasy at the times when those editions were printed. Yeah, there's... A- there's a good amount of covers, that, and they are pretty good. Yeah. So, one. and I know we printed. I know we put. We posted all the covers on our Instagram at one point, and we'll probably do it again. And we, I always uh, put as many covers as I can find on the YouTube right. uh, version of this podcast. Yes. And so this quote from the io9 article said, "An often forgotten and misunderstood early Philip K. Dick novel is the Cosmic Puppets." First released in the late 50s and reprinted over the years with covers that reflect publishers and the public's changing perception of this weird book. First of all, as David Gill of Total Dickhead, that's a blog, by the way, Total Dickhead points out, the novel is probably best viewed as fantasy, even though it's usually marketed as a book about, quote, galactic invaders. The war may be galactic, he argues, but the invaders are from ancient Persia, and they use magical weapons. And they are petty as shit. Check out the strange ways the cover has been redone over the years as the popularity of science fiction versus fantasy has waxed and waned. Right? Interesting. So so if you look at the cover that Ace Double did, which has, like, a guy with a go-go dancer inside a glass thing, (laughs) right? That's... Very different from the Glass of Darkness cover, which has some, like... <laughs> some weird galactic <laughs> admirable juggling... I would say it's like a galactic Nazi juggling, like, planets. Yeah, it, me no understand. <laughs> yeah, it looks like a Nazi in a matador outfit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Nazi's gonna sing, like, La Cucaracha at my table at El Torito. <laughs> right. While juggling these planets. And then the Ace version has frickin' Zeus on it. Oh, it's confusing. It's and then the um the Mariner with edition. Bolt and all. Yeah, the Mariner edition that I have has just some glossy looking high def spider webs. And David, yours is just confusing. Yeah, is that vin- another Mariner edition? The, no, this is a vintage, and the vintage one has like this weird space background with two people like melting into each other. Yeah. Yeah, the covers are really weird, and they say lots of different things. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I, I suggest you, if you haven't seen the different covers, you could just do a Google image search for Cosmic Puppets. and all Or watch things. our YouTube version. Or watch the YouTube version, which Larry spends a lot of time on. And you can see the different covers, and, like, holy shit, it's... Uh, it's weird. <laughs> <laughs> but it's 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 pretty cool it's to look weird. at the evolution of the covers over time. I'd agree with that IO9 article. Yeah. And who wrote it? Uh, the IO9 article? Yeah. I don't know who wrote the article, but the quote was from David Gill, who does a... you got to give credit where it's due, man. David Gill. The, the quote is David Gill, who does <laughs> a blog called Total Dickhead, which I have read before, and it's a really good blog. Uh, I don't know that he's still doing it. If so, let's reach out to David Gill. See if we can get him on uh, Dickheads. Yeah. Yeah. Just like I want to get those guys from Weird Studies. Carry on. Yes. 
Okay, meeting adjourned. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, <laughs> so, I guess that's the publishing history, because then there was the vintage edition, and then um, what are these editions that, that you guys keep getting? The so Mariner? we have the Mariner editions. Yeah. Yeah, the Mariner editions are just like a, a, a cheap... Uh, a, they have a cheap version of every... Single PKD book. Yeah, there's no, like, interesting covers. They just kind of, like, have the title on in there and, like, some kind of weird background, mostly. Yeah, yep. it's... it's it, and it pretty, says PKD. Boring. Yeah. Yeah. They're pretty boring covers, I, I honestly. I'd say, uh, so, while we're talking covers, uh, what's your favorite cover, everybody? Starting with Anthony. Of the books we've... Oh, of, of just the, the Cosmic Puppets? Just the Cosmic Puppets is um, your favorite cover. I haven't looked at all of the ones. I can only see the ones that are available to me right now. Um, uh, Larry has on his screen the, the Ace Double one. Can you scroll down a little bit, Larry? I think you yeah. mean scroll up. Scroll up. So you can kind of see what the... There's that one. That's the original Ace cover. Uh, I think I'll always probably default to the Ace covers. I like that one. I like weird intergalactic uh, mariachi Nazi <laughs> on the Glass of Darkness cover for Satellite Fiction. I think uh, some Bizarro is going to write <laughs> that mariachi intergal- Nazi intergalactic uh, yeah intergalactic mariachi Nazi. Nazi. Yep, yeah. I think uh, that sounds good. I think that's a new Eraserhead book. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, y- you like uh, yeah probably the Ace the Ace Double one, even though I. I don't really think it reflects the book. It's 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 got that art that I like so much. I don't think any of them reflect the book. Uh, my high def spider web seen. kind of does. Not really. I'm gonna go with uh, me personally. I'm gonna go with uh, Nazi mariachi guy. I think is my favorite favorite of the covers from the satellite science fiction. Ooh, dickhead shirt. I think there's a, a, ch- a Japanese cover that I really like, but. Uh, I don't have it up right now, and I can't show you guys. Well, that. But no, there's several. There's but, several but foreign it's covers. Probably on the screen right now during our YouTube video. I stuff. would be yeah. willing to bet most of the foreign editions have better covers. There's a lot of really good foreign covers for Dick books. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you can see those by going to the Goodreads page for each of the books. Yes. That's like how I find all those versions of them. All right, so enough about the publishing history. What did Philip K. Dick have to say about this book? Well, I don't know, David. What did he have to say? Well, in a letter written in 1955, he said, I have a manuscript of a fantasy novel. He called it a fantasy novel. Because it is. Okay, I have a manuscript of a fantasy novel, which I wrote two years ago. It runs about 80,000 words. So it was much longer at that time. My agent won't handle it because there's no market. I thought about printing it privately. The only catch is this. It's not exactly the kind of fantasy one reads in fantasy magazines. It's a psychological fantasy of the dream type. More like Kafka, I suppose. Like the man who was Thursday. There is no, there is no fantasy premise that is a fantastic postulate from which things proceed logically. The beginning is, na- is natural, factual, normal as in Hubbard's fear, the ordinary world, in fact, from there, the book degenerates into sheer fantasy. As my agent puts it, it progresses, I would say, into greater and deeper levels of fantasy, a trip into the dream regions of symbolism, the unconscious, as one finds in Alice in Wonderland, where the work ends with a final cataclysm of dream fantasy. Okay, so there's a bunch of interesting things in this quote. Yes. First of all, he... Unpack it for me, David. Calls it a psychological fantasy of the dream type, okay? And he thinks that it starts off very solid, right? And becomes more dreamlike and more fantasy-like as it goes on. That's when bees start talking. Oh, <laughs> I, the fucking bees talking. It turned into a <laughs> Disney book at that point. He knows um, what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> more like Kafka, he says. Mm-hmm. So he he compares it to Kafka. He didn't think... (laughs) It's more Lewis Carroll than Kafka. But he does bring up Alice in Wonderland later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think he was... And he compares it to L. Ron Hubbard's Fear. Which I don't don't know that book. Okay, Fear is a... I refuse to read anything by L. Ron Hubbard. Well... Especially one book called Mission Earth. Okay. (laughs) 
Um, you are missing out on a couple things. Have you ever read a book called Dianetics? One of, listen. (laughs) Tell me more, Larry. (laughs) I know L. Ron Hubbard is a fucking joke and there's a lot of fucking bullshit about him because he created a fucking religion to steal money from people. But, before he did that. But let me, but, but let me explain to you why L. Ron's kind of an alright guy. Is that where you're going with this? I'm not going to say, no, no, he's a shithead. (laughs) This is David's in defense of L. Ron Hubbard. In defense of two L. Ron (laughs) Hubbard books. L. Ron Hubbard has a book um, called Fear that that Dick mentions right here, and Fear is a really great, fucking weird, kind of like horror, fantasy weird thing, and it's very good. And he also, in the 40s, like before, or in the late 30s, like right, like 1940, he wrote a science fiction novel called The Final Blackout that kind of predicted World War II. I mean, everyone saw it coming at that point, but... But the final blackout is fucking amazing. It really is. For, that remi- that reminds time. me, David. The uh, that was years before he, he just, lost his went fucking wackadoo. I, I right? just want to. I just want to uh, say the that movie. the uh, the podcast or not the podcast, the YouTube page, um, extra science fiction, mm-hmm. started their second season of the science fiction show this week. Oh, did they just, did they talk L. Ron Hubbard? Is that why? Yeah, you... they they mentioned L. Ron Hubbard as one of the big three, along with Clark and um, who else? Yeah, yeah. I mean, L. Ron as the, like the biggest science fiction writers Asimov. that changed. Yeah, it was Asimov, Arthur C. Clarke. You're right. Look, look, and and the Mission Earth books are dumb, dumb as shit because he was already. But a he fucking... supposedly wrote some really good. Story. Final Blackout is amazing. I will go to the mat for Final Blackout, especially if you consider that it was written in like 1940. All right. You know. All right. I, I, I I'm mean, going to read it, and then the next episode we're going to talk about it. Oh fuck! <laughs> <laughs> oh fuck! You're going to read it, okay? Yeah. I, I'll back it. So I, I believe in it. And he also, you know, Battlefield Earth is dumb as shit as the movie was. Oh boy, is it? I mean, I when, when I was a kid, I really loved that book. Before I knew what a shithead L. Ron Hubbard was. But back, okay, we're getting on a tangent, but um, Dick compares the cosmic puppets to fear, and I get it. I get it. Fear is definitely kind of in a, a similar vein. And I will say, too, that Final Blackout, if you are, if any of you out there are going to read it with Anthony, it is very anarchist themed. Come um, read it with me at my apartment. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And that's how I started a cult. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I don't know if there's anything else to pack else to pack out Unpacked. of that quote. Unpack out of that quote. I think the next thing really is he compares to Alice in Wonderland and, and you I Larry, you, you Obvious, thought, obviously there's a little girl that goes into the forest and talks to the bees and they uh, talk uh, back. It's yeah. pretty obvious there. Yeah. Okay. So a little girl. Oh, we'll talk about that. Oh, we'll get to that because I have yeah. some things I have to say. I have about some it. things I got to say about that. <laughs> so I have one the other... barrier. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have one other Philip K. Dick quote from a letter about the Casper puppets or an interview or something. He said, "Ace has one more book of mine, but this one was already has already appeared in a magazine satellite. The title." For that printing was A Glass of Darkness. It runs about 40,000 words. You can see that it is slight compared with the others, but again, personal, I, I personally like it. It's pure fantasy, which, as you know, has always been my favorite. So guess what? Between the first letter and the second letter, he halved that novel. Right. So there was a version that was like 300 pages <laughs> instead of 100. Oof. <laughs> Well, maybe Fuck. that one, because <laughs> this one know. was this one was forty about forty thousand words, one hundred and forty three pages. Twenty my... more pages. It, it read bees. it read really quickly. I think. Yeah, I thought it read really fast. I mean, if if you have complaints about the Cosmic Puppets, like like wasting your time is not one of them. It, it's nah. Yeah. I blew through this in like four hours. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So total. So I, <laughs> I mean, I I it's just. Insane to me that there's a eighty thousand word version out there. And then my question is: is is there in the Philip K. Dick Library in the in in the collections? Is there anywhere where that eighty thousand eighty thousand word version exists? Is there a right. Phil, is there a Philip K. Dick collection? 
like it is is does some museum or some library or maybe some university library have all, all of his unpublished works? We'll have to look or, into that. Like I know my buddy who's a librarian at the University of Oregon was telling me that they have the Ursula Le Guin collection there and he was going to if I next time I come up to Oregon he's going to take me there. Awesome. So, and I know there's an Octavia Butler collection at a library in LA somewhere. Yeah, which we can visit because I know it's one that you can make appointments to visit. So, which we ought to do. And uh, and SDSU has the diary of Carl Panzram. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> huh? I don't know who that is. Oh, he's a serial killer. <laughs> oh, that sounds interesting. But anyways, uh, yeah. So I don't know. If there's an eighty thousand word out version out there. I suppose I would read it just to be a completionist, since we're. I'd probably read it just to see yeah. how different it was. And yeah. Now, see if it was better. Now, see Larry, you read both versions, the, the magazine version and, and the novel version. At some point, yeah. we're, we're going to talk about the differences, probably after we break uh, down. I, uh, yeah, I'll probably, I'll probably talk about it when I go through the... Uh, through, the through the book. Yep. Okay, so we're going to get into the story now. Sweet. All right, so the story itself. Larry, should, well, first, should we read one of the back cover descriptions, or did we do that? I mean, we did that last episode. Yeah, we've done that. Yeah. We've done it. So let's talk about what the story is. We should probably start doing that to start off episodes instead of at the end of every episode. Right. Yeah. Maybe. Uh, no, I don't know. Okay, meeting adjourned. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. All right, so the, the story of the Cosmic Puppets. So a guy named Ted Barton and his <laughs> wife are on vacation. And Ted decides that he wants to visit the town that he was born in and grew up in. So they go to that town, and everything is different. The town is no bum, longer bum, the same bum. town. <laughs> do, 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 None of the stores are the same stores. None of the houses are the same houses. None of the people are the same people. He freaks out like a douchebag and uh, drops his wife off at a hotel out of town. By the way, this this is his first science fiction or fantasy novel, and this is a theme that PKD hits on a lot is he loves – the idea of just one thing being different or one person being slightly um, out of sync with the rest of the universe. And so I kind of got misdirected a little bit when I was reading this, thinking that it was going to be basically just a story of this Ted guy, like, being out of place. Right. right. So just, anyways, interjecting that okay. on, the, on the theme. So. Yeah. He drops his wife off. He goes back to the town of Melgate and decides he's going to do some detective work and figure it out. But he doesn't really do any real detective work. <laughs> he meets up he with does a little a lot kid. Of whining. <laughs> yes, he does a lot of that. He meets up with a little kid named Peter little and prick. tries to get some information off him <laughs> in a bizarre sort of uh, psychological war that he has with a little kid. In a better book, he's going to. Like interrogate Peter, right, with, right, with, with jumper cables and a car battery. But let's talk about <laughs> so, let's talk about Peter. Wait, wait, wait. Let's, let me just get through this goddamn thing. All right, so come to find out, <laughs> come to find out that the town is being changed by these two gods that sit on opposite sides of the valley where the town is, or at least that's what he thinks. He. he it turns out that one of the gods is actually changing things from the other one's vision. And it's a cosmic war between these two gods. And everybody else in the town is a what, Larry? Uh, never mind, a cosmic puppet. Oh, jeez. Oh, my God. I didn't know you were going or that Or wanderers. Route. <laughs> or what? I thought you were going to say wanderers. Or yeah. wanderers. Well, we'll get to that. Yeah, the wanderers are people that don't really seem to be, they're ghosts. According well, to the people in the town, right? They just wander around, and they always have their eyes closed, and it's very confusing to our hero in quotes, Ted Barton. Yeah, the as first, to why they exist at all. The first reading I have is about the wanderers, so we'll get to that in a little bit. But but the uh, then it turns out there's this big war that happens between the two to take over the town, and between the two gods. And then everything is resolved with, uh, with Ted and another guy. Uh, what's his name? Dennis Christopher? Whatever his name is. Yeah. So, I think it's Will Christopher. Will Christopher? 
I could be wrong. Yeah, they uh, they end up making a beautiful woman, and everything works out. Yeah. Um, there you go. That's the quick rundown. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, because they find out. Well, maybe I'll wait. Okay, so uh, what I wanted the point I wanted that the thirteen year old Mary was a hot goddess all the time. Yeah, so I have some problems with that. <laughs> yeah, well, look, but let's talk. About, let's talk do. about Peter Trilling. We definitely <laughs> one thing we did like about the book was that Peter Trilling is uh, a good antagonist. Yeah, in the book great evil little kid. And here's the thing: like evil little kids are like kind of something we're used to, but this is 1953 when he wrote it. Mm-hmm. So like, I can't even think of one that would appear before that. Yeah. So e- even though it seems like kind of like a trope that we've seen a bunch, um, we haven't had the episode of the Twilight Zone with the uh, with the cornfields with the kid that that right, managed with Anthony. <laughs> Wish it into the you. cornfield. His name is Anthony. Oh. <laughs> Wish it into the cornfield, Anthony. Yeah. Didn't they later do that same episode, but in, in color for the yeah, movie for the Twilight yes. Zone the movie? Yeah. yeah. Um, and the kid from Lost in Space played the kid in the original Twilight yep. Zone episode. It's, I mean, both are good. Um, that, the one in the Twilight Zone movie freaked me out when yeah, I was a kid. Yeah, it freaked me out yeah, too. Because the, the visuals are just insanity. And yep. that, that's Joe Dante, I think, directed that one. That segment? That makes yeah. sense. Yeah, it's really, really freaky. But, um, but yeah, so I would almost say that that, episode of the twilight zone might have been influenced by by this character possibly, possibly. i mean it, it is a kid with magical powers yeah like, cer- like peter trilling has a certain dickhead to my left has compared this book before to an episode of the twilight zone true so, yeah in, in, in tone. And it's so it, it does have that sort of vibe to it that twilight zone feeling yeah and a certain dickhead to my right here tonight, uh, de- definitely said that you thought that, well, you already said that, that he's uh, just a really good um, antagonist and villain. Mm-hmm. And, and we both, um, you know, we all agree on that. And, and I, I definitely think it was ahead of, ahead of the time making that character. And, and because he's the one that first introduces Ted to the ideas of the barrier and stuff like that. I th- the barrier. Yeah. <laughs> I think um, it's my new thing. I I trusted the kid at first, you know, because yeah. I because I thought the way he was written was really well done. Um, this was something I was going to talk about in my writing tips well, bonus. He, even when he even when he uh, steps on the golems that he made in the beginning, it doesn't necessarily mean that he's doing anything wrong. I didn't like this kid from the jump. Really, really, because no. I thought I, I just I thought he was like helpful. The, the way beginning. the the way the book begins, where it's very pastoral and the you're you're looking at classic '50s society, where you know kids are playing in the yard and mom's cooking supper and the doctor, the kindly neighborhood doctor, comes over to visit. Blah blah blah. Visit. And nah. everything seems yeah, you know where everything going. seems like it's going to be absolutely normal throughout, and I really liked that opening. Yeah, I thought I thought it opened really strongly too, and and I think something that I'm going to talk about when we do when when I do the writing tips episode for Cosmic Puppets is that there are two different ways that he could have started this story, which is he could have sent a character in with absolutely no knowledge of the town where his his. Are you, are you doing the thing now? No, it's going to be a little different when I do it. <laughs> but you, you could send him in that way. You could send him in that way with no knowledge, kind of like how Children of the Corn, for example, starts. Right. Where the characters go in, they don't know anything about the town, so you could go in totally blind and just be like, what is this town? But I think, and whereas it seems like, something that's more normal in narrative story structure these days is to have him have a personal connection to the town. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it was completely obvious at the time of, of, of his of writing this that he would be the one thing that's out of place, right? And right. that's that's the thing that, that PKD does, and I think that that really makes the first half very strong because you definitely are driven to understand why he is the one thing that's out of place. Yeah. I think one of the problems with this novel is that it sets up that mystery really well and then just kind of... Well, it just goes in a different direction. It goes in a different direction. And I think the mystery could have been 
it could have gone further into the book and it would have been a little better. Yeah, and it would have, I mean, the whole thing would have been better if Ted Barton wasn't such a terrible character. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's he's pretty plain, and, and the fact that he just kind he's of... He's not just plain, he whines constantly. He has no arc. Yeah. No, he doesn't at all. Barton has no arc. We spend 100, and in my edition is 136 pages, he learns not a fucking thing or cha- has any kind of change or motivation. His motivation was to figure out what happened, but then once he figures it out, he's like, oh, okay, I've accepted this. It's fine. Right. And, and then, then the- he falls in love, and then he drives through two boobs. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Dumb. <end> story. <laughs> You're getting ahead of the, the boob talk. I think narratively speaking that the book is is kind of a mess, and I think maybe I don't want to believe, and I don't believe that if we saw the 80,000 word one that suddenly there would be in that version there would be more of an arc for Ted Ted right one could imagine that maybe there was and maybe he chose to cut I, I feel like there would be a lot more about Peter and Mary yeah but I, I don't know I mean I feel like he maybe got too wackadoo about the whole Zaraster thing in the mm-hmm. 80,000 word version well we but, hit a certain point in the book and it becomes because magic huh? right yeah <laughs> I didn't care for it which is, I kind of I liked the magic of the of the kids that they were using. It reminded me a lot of Charles DeLint stories, where it's sort of the the urban version of magic, where it's not witches and and cauldrons and all that stuff. It's just sort of a a quick movement with the hands and some some stuff you have nearby that you can use to make magic. No, and I appreciated that. One thing that's interesting, just from a personal aspect of how I read this book, is that um, I didn't. I usually dog ear pages where I want to go back and read things during the podcast and or parts that I want to point out, and I didn't do that until eighty-one pages in. Wow. Um, and I think because of what we were saying was that I was kind of hooked by the first part of yeah. you know, and I just. I kind of missed the, um, I, I don't know, I just didn't, like, get a ton of details out of out of the first part. And I think, in a lot of ways, I, I, I've been very cognizant or aware that I'm reading for a podcast in uh, past books that we've read. And this one, I, I kind of forgot for a little bit. <laughs> but once I, the first note that I got is page 81, which was talking about the Wanderers. Now, is that where he first meets the Wanderers, or... Um, on the porch? Mary is, she's in bed reading. Oh, Mary, okay, when Mary talks to the the old woman wanderer. Yeah, and to me that was when... Or the main wanderer, I guess. For, for whatever reason, that was like one of the first parts of the book that really struck me, is because I really liked the concept of the wanderers. Um, by the way, Anthony's distracting me by showing me on his phone uh, different covers for the Cosmic Puppets. Well, I'm trying to talk. I thought Anthony was not going to use his phone this Yeah, time. he was supposed to be putting it I away. I wanted to look at these covers. You have a real problem. We're going to have to have an intervention soon. <sighs> okay. Fucking, it's like, it's like having, it's like having dads. Uh, who, who I'll are be the, your daddy. Oh, please, just, can we just stop? <laughs> um yes. So anyways, when the when the Wanderers appeared, for me, that was like one of the first parts where I loved this paragraph, this description of the Wanderers and the concept of the like ghost-like people that were in the city. And so it was, uh, Mary was curled up on her bed reading a magazine when the Wanderer appeared. What, no mention of her breasts? I'll get to that. We're, right. we're, we're going right. to talk about that I'm in just depth, so itching it's, it's to get to that part. real weird. You want to get to that part because it's the very end. No, uh, no, it's throughout. Yeah. Um, it's creepy. Okay. The wanderer appeared. It came from the wall and slowly crossed the room. Eyes shut tight, fists clenched, lips moving. Mary put her mag- put down her magazine at once and got quickly to her feet. This was a wanderer she had seen before, an older woman, perhaps 40, tall and heavy with gray hair and thick breasts. There you go. Under her rough one-piece garment, her stern face was twisted in a deadly serious expression. Her lips continued to move as she crossed the room, passed through the big chair, and then disappeared through the far wall without a sound. Like, I thought that was creepy, okay? Right. And I also liked that this was the first time... But 
How is what? that different that than is- the uh, first appearance of them? Um, because when the couple walks through the porch, I feel it has exactly that same feel. I don't know. For some reason, that particular time, I thought the prose in this paragraph was the first time where I really felt like strength in the writing mm-hmm. for whatever okay. for whatever reason. And considering this is an early novel for him, um, I just I I saw more of a style more stylism going on here, you know. Okay. In the writing, and I just hadn't experienced that before. So for me, like, yes, and, and the part in the porch was good. Uh, I like that, too. But this is also the first scene where the Wanderer kind of, where the Wanderer recruits Mary for the struggle. And as far as I'm concerned, this, is this the first time that the recruiting happens? Of no, the Mary, Mary has talked to the Wanderer several times. She's talked to him before, but is the, to me, this is the first time I remember them, her being specifically recruited for the struggle. Am I right or wrong about that? Uh, you might be right about that. Yeah. And so, and I liked this. And then, um, so Mary says, you wanted to see me, didn't you? Mary asked politely. She was a little impatient. Somebody might come. And in addition, she was sure something important was happening. What was it about? And then the wanderer says, we need information. Mary repressed a sigh. What sort of information? As you know, we've made progress. Everything has been carefully mapped out and synthesized. We've drawn up a detailed, a detailed original and, ac- and accurate in every respect, but, and then she says, but it means nothing. The Wanderer disagreed. It means a great deal, but somehow we failed to develop a sufficient, and, uh, sufficient potential. Our model is static, without energy. To bridge the gap, to make the leap across, we need more power. Mary smiled. Yes, I think so. The Wanderer's eyes fixed on her hungrily. Such power exists. I know, I know you don't have it, but someone does. We're sure of it. It exists here, and we have to have it. So, I liked that. Was to me a very important part, um, right? In the uh, recruitment for the struggle. So we're starting to see battle lines drawn, and and you know. Uh, well, we also see that in Peter's workshop, where he's he's got all of his creatures. You know, in jars and cages and how he takes care of them earlier on in the book. Mm -hmm. And how the bees attack him. Right. Uh, Which I thought was a good scene, too, where he's just walking through the field. And it's not described as bee stings. It's described as, like, lightning passing through him and all these other descriptions. Now, I know you guys didn't really like this book, but um, that's not a beer, by the way. Um, But it could be. Could be. (laughs) <laughs> I just I'm thinking of the flop house there like how they used to always just like crack them open. No, they do that on who goes there too. Yes. But uh <laughs> oh, I'm sorry I lost my train of thought. But um you said I know you guys didn't like the book. I know you guys didn't like the book, but I definitely did like how fucking wackadoo the book was and how it wasn't like anything else that I had ever really read that it was just really kind of its own thing like I mean, as much as I love Solar Lottery and I like some of the ones that we've read before, that there there was context for, you know, he was trying to do something that was like Van, Van Vogt, you know? Right. There was, and, and I think that this book is, I know he compared it to Alice in Wonderland and Kafka at times, but, you know, that's not like something you go into Ace, you know, to put, pitch an Ace <laughs> double and say, I want to write Kafka meets Alice in Wonderland. Right. And so I really, I kind of a, appreciated this book for being so fucking weird. Well, appreciation is different than liking, you know, and you have to admit the main character was terrible. The main character was terrible. And so I, 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 I like the concepts. I like, uh, what's going on. And yes, if there was more, but of the concept op- is also kind of diluted. Uh, I mean, we, these gods are there. I don't know. It, it's sort of. I don't necessarily think the concept's diluted as much as it's oversimplified, mm-hmm. I can in see my that. opinion. Yeah, and, and I just... I like but the, the Wanderers th- having no value whatsoever. Well, but here's an interesting thing about the Wanderers. It says that they, what, they walk through with their eyes closed? Right, because once they open their eyes, they're part of the world. Okay, because yeah. that, that, that confused me just a little bit. 
Okay. So if they're not part of the world, what's up, David? Page 100 of the Vintage Edition. Um, who are the Wanderers? People of the Old Town. I thought so. People who weren't completely altered by the change. It missed a number of them. The change came and left them more or less unaffected. It varies. Like me, Christopher murmured. Mead eyed him. Yes, you're a wanderer. With a little practice, you could learn to bypass the distortion and night walk, like the others. But that would be all. You, could, you couldn't you could bring the old town back. You're distorted to some degree, every one of you. None of you has a perfect memory. So I think what he's saying on this <coughs> page is, is that the... And how they relate to the wider story is that the Wanderers are the people that are kind of trapped in between the battle. Right, it's like, sort of a horror element. Yeah. It is, and, and there's a really interesting thing here. They're in limbo. The, but it, they, doesn't, they it doesn't really have any consequence. Well, oh, there's a consequence if you open your eyes, as seen in this paragraph I'm about to read to you, Larry. Yeah, no, he got trapped and died. It was oh, awful. you fucking dick. You took it. You took it. <laughs> read it. Go ahead, read it. <laughs> Mary hurried out of the room, down the hall, and outside. She ran around the side of the house to the place opposite her own room. As she waited for the wanderer to emerge, she couldn't help thinking of the one who had gone too far, but not far enough to be outside the house. He had opened his eyes within the wall, apparently. In any case, he had never emerged and there had been a loathsome smell for weeks after. He died in the fucking wall! That's great. And, I love the, and it the is, smell and, and part of it. so blasé about it. The, the dead guy in the wall. I imagine that in this world, there's probably at least a half a dozen other dead people trapped in weird spots. That's a more interesting book. I would right. like to read that right. one instead. <laughs> well, yeah, we'll instead of just a small one-paragraph mention, like... Actually having that be part of the story. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. what I'm saying. There's a lack of consequence in the story. You're saying that there is a consequence, yes. But they, it's not used in the story. It's just talked about. It's just and then kind it of never background. comes up again. No, they never address it again. Yeah, and, and so let's talk about the cosmic struggle here that's going on and, and the two forces. So, so PKD d- kind of chose... He wanted to, to base this in, in an ancient religion, so the gods of which are struggling over this town come from the Zoroaster tradition. Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrianism. <laughs> um, which is the, one of the oldest religions on uh, planet Earth, which is the only one we have to choose religions from. As opposed point. to all those... Religions on Jupiter, David. <laughs> exactly. Or the um, moon base. Oh Jesus Christ! I gotta, <laughs> yeah, I gotta get up early in the morning, guys. I'm tired. But um, let me tell you. Something. Oh, he is really uh, Dan McCoying this podcast. Shout out to all my Flop House <laughs> listeners. <laughs> Woo! Um, but what what I would say is that I think it's interesting. I mean, there's not a ton of novels that are inspired by the Zoroasters, so I do right. think that that's kind of an interesting thing. But it's also such a kind of lost and I mean, how many people uh, raise your hand out there if you know what the Z- fucking Zoroasters are, or know anything about them? Well, I think that's the reason th- he chose it in the first place was that no one knew who they were. Well, but I think when you say it, when you when you call it what it's called, it sounds confusing. But when you read what it's actually about, you'll realize that in a good amount of it's the base. I mean, maybe not the basis, but it, it there's a lot of other modern religions that are essentially the same right. thing. Yeah. Well, well, there's stories of Zoroastrianism in the Old Testament, so or at least characters from. Now, it's it's not as what I'm trying to say is that it's not as kind of unheard of as you might think when you hear the name. But when if you look at it from a writer's perspective, he was looking for a god and instead of making up his own gods, which well, he also could have done, he wanted to use real gods. And instead of using ones that people would know right away, like the Greek gods or you know, Christian saints or anything like that. Right. He had the sun fight the blob. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so why Milltown, right? So why Millgate. Millgate. Mil- Any town USA. Any town USA. Why Virginia? Um, so there's this quote on 103. <clears throat> Uh, Mead is talking. I don't understand much of it. 
A contest, a struggle of some kind, with rules. One hand tied behind the back, and something got in. Forced its way into the valley. Eighteen years ago, it found a weak place. A crack through which it could enter. It always tried, eternally. The two of them. Eternal conflict. He built all this. This world. And then took advantage of the rules. Came through, and it changed everything. That was... Wackadoo mysticism. That is... Wackadoo mysticism. I, I still don't think that fully explains why this place. He found a crack, so is it supposed to be the idea that there's... I mean, it's supposed to be the idea that there's this great cosmic forces, almost in a Lovecraftian fashion, uh, right. that yeah. just happen to worm their way into our plane of reality in this spot. And so this crack in this valley is where the two forces kind of slip out into our world and now they're trapping the people there because they're using they're each like pawns in a little chess game. Right. Right. So uh, okay concepts. Uh I mean that's 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 basically what it comes down to. I mean there's there's not much I mean when when you get into all the details of the different weird things that happen, um if it had been more character driven and had maybe twice the length um, maybe we could have more understanding of how this cosmic struggle affects the individuals who live in the city or, or live right. in this town. Yeah. And I think the biggest weakness of the cosmic puppets is that you have, that they are just chess pieces. They're not people. And, and look, you can compare. And again, they have no value in the final struggle. Yeah. Compar- no, but I think a, b- a way to combat that would be to have had, make it a longer book and have one of the, POVs be someone who is stuck in this kind of limbo world. Right. So we're not just with shitty kids in a shitty protagonist who never stops whining. Right. Right. And I think one of the things that, um, you, if you compare this to the Twilight Zone, let's take the segment of the Twilight Zone movie version with the, the little kid that could blank you way to the cornfields and control everybody. Or put you in that weird cartoon. Right. right. Now, that episode works partially because the woman who's the main character, um, we empathize with her. She has to get somewhere. I don't remember exactly where, but she, you know, you want her to escape and you're really worried about it. Yeah. At, at any point where you worried about, oh shit, we gotta get Ted out of there. You can give a shit about Ted. Right. There's, Even when he was stuck no. in the logs? Yeah. Uh, nah. When he tries to go through the barrier, I didn't really care. I don't care about right. anything that Ted is doing, because Ted is a blank, boring person. And it's it's cornball as shit, but I think it's a really wise thing that, that Stephen King used to always say, is that you have to care to scare. And if you don't yeah. care, care about your characters, then no one's going to be scared for them. And, and I think the, the biggest number one problem with... The cosmic puppets is that there's just no reason to give a shit about the characters. And there are reasons that he should care. Like, for for instance, his wife le- is going to leave him, and he's totally blasé about that as well. I, I think it's fair. It's safe to say Ted didn't give a fuck about Peg. No, he, he, <laughs> he said, didn't. All right, fine, whatever. I mean, which, which Dick explains in the end. He's like, well, Peg was kind of boring anyway. But that's, a, <laughs> that's a, like a real cop out there that, you know... It, it, he had an element that he didn't use. His marriage was on the line. At least he worked that in, and maybe we care about that element. Eh. But keep in mind, everybody um, at home or in this room, this was his first attempt at writing uh, this kind of novel. And, and so, you know, we're looking, we're reading this. Hey, what? I'm not giving out participation trophies here. No, I'm not saying that, but... This is we're we're reading this fourth in line, but Larry's good job award. What is it? A half finished Pacific bottle of Pacifico? Probably. <laughs> it says uh, good job in Sharpie on it. Um but the reason I bring that up is this is the fourth novel that we've read, right? So yeah. yep. it we've seen growth. We've seen growth as of, of him as a writer, so And it, this is technically an earlier novel than those? Right. And so we have to look at this in the context of this was written before Solar Lottery. This was written before Japed and and, and the World Jones. Japed and Jones. Japed and Jones. The name of my new law firm. <laughs> Japed and Jones. That's pretty good. So so you know, we we've we've seen 
what I think is good here is that there's good parts to this book. There's good yeah. ideas. Yeah. There's cool. There's parts of really good writing. Oh but, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and like for example, on page one away to the vintage edition, I I really love this. And then he understood it was destroying, it was changing things as the buildings and houses sank into the fire and other shapes emerged to take their places. Other forms rising up from the lapping glow, objects he had never seen before, shapes unfamiliar, alien to him. That's fucking cool. Yeah. And what he's doing there, it, it reminds me of a lot of like Inception or Dark City, those like kind of like city transform. I mean, because he's talking, he, he's overlooking the valley in that part. Right. It all happen. However. <laughs> oh boy. Are we talking about it now? Can we talk about it now, David? No, no, I'm not there yet. Jesus I got Christ. To, um. Let's all wait for David, I guess. <laughs> well, no, I got I, just some other things that I um. Doop 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 doop. Well, we're almost done, but. Oh no, we're not done yet. As we as so as, as, as Marcellus Wallace about. once said. I ain't through with the cosmic puppets by damn sight. <laughs> well, I remember that line. <laughs> when, it was when, in Mission Impossible. When, <laughs> <laughs> I really do like how cosmic it got towards the end, um, page 122, 123. When the Shoggoth shows up? I think so, yeah, because it's like, Barton crushed golems and rats underfoot as he retreated, his tire iron swinging furiously. And then he gets, um... The hair quivered and twitched, sprouted and extended itself in all directions. Bits of the thing were deposited down the slope. The way it had come, like a cosmic slug, it left a trail of slime and offal as it went. It fed constantly. It was bloating itself on things it caught. Its tentacles swept up wanderers, golems, rats, and snakes indiscriminately. He could see a rubbish heap of cadavers littered through its jelly in all stages of de decomposition. It swept up and absorbed everything, all life, whatever it touched. It turned life into a barren path of filth, ruin, and death. Oh, I like that part. That is fucking cool. Yeah. And very Lovecraftian in that moment, too. Right. That is The unformed thing. evil. Right. And there's another scene... Meade pulled violently away, turned awkwardly, and stumbled off, down the road, hunched over like an animal, and then he stiffened. His arms flailed out, his body jerked, and danced like a puppet on a wire. His face quivered. It seemed to melt and fall inward, shapeless pools of wax. Barton hurried, ar Barton hurried after him. Meade collapsed. He rolled in agony and then leaped. Convulsions swept over him. Frenzied vibrations that snapped his limbs out, head back, reeling and flailing blindly. Me, Barton shouted. He grabbed a hold of the man's shoulder. The coat was smoldering. Acrid fumes stung his nose, and the coat ripped away. Barton spun him around and grabbed him by the collar. It wasn't me. It wasn't anybody he had seen or anything he had ever seen. It wasn't a human being. Dr. Mead's face was gone. What hardened and reformed was strong and harsh. He saw it only a second. A sudden glimpse. The hawk-like beak. The thin lips. The wild gray eyes, dilated nostrils, long sharp teeth. I just, um, I love that. Yeah. And then, and then, and then you realize that Ted Barton is not affected by seeing the face of God. Right. And then there was like he's just like, well, the town's back. Hey, isn't that awesome? Well, and this then, guy doesn't remember me. Okay, my wife's gone. Look at those I was big also giant unaffected. boobies. Unaffected. A group of luminous balls seemed familiar after measureless time. Much <laughs> thought he managed to place them. The Pleiades. So he's like looking at the seven he's, sisters. Stars. He's falling through the stars. Yeah, he's just falling and this is like, woo! It's wacky, and, and I, I definitely love that. Did you have a part you wanted to go to, Anthony? Because I had just one last part. The bees arriving in vast swarms for the cosmic battle, but it, the bees were arriving in vast storms. But it didn't matter. Uh, much anymore. The valley, the whole earth had been passed by. The battleground had widened. It took everything, every particle of matter in the universe and perhaps beyond. Rats streaked off wildly, covered with stinging, lashing bees. Bzz, bzz. Cosmic battle, <laughs> so it's like... Cosmic bees. Bzz. That's, that's everything. <laughs> that's, that's the last part I have. Well, I, you know, I liked Mary's death. I yeah, thought that, it was that an was, amazing that was, scene. That was pretty brutal. And, and unexpected... 
even yeah. though you, even though you kind of knew she, you know, she had two bodies at that time. So, two bodies, huh, Larry? It's funny you should mention that. It's what, funny her you body? should mention that her body and her uh, when she steals the golem from Peter. Right. Hmm. So I'm going to read this little passage. It's a little bit long, so everybody just bear with me. And um, Mary has, I guess, what would you say? She's taken one of Peter's golems hostage. hostage? Yes. And she realizes... And put it under glass. ...that she needs to become also the golem. Now I'm going to read this to you. How old is uh, Mary, Larry? Thirteen. Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. The first thing she did was take off all her clothes. She piled them neatly at the foot of the bed, oh, as no. if she were in the bathroom taking a shower. Oh, no. Then she got the jar of suntan oil from the medicine cabinet and carefully rubbed oil over her naked body. Oh, no. It was necessary to look as much like the golem as possible. There were limitations, of course. It was a man, and she wasn't. But her body was young and unformed. Her breasts were still small not developed at all. She was slim and lithe, very much like a youth. It would do. So there's more to this, yeah. but I already feel like I need to take a shower and right. and just um, think about where my life is at a little bit. But I want to know, how do you guys feel about this? I because there's... I just... I didn't assume <clears throat> that she was 13 years old. I just missed... I just missed that altogether. You didn't know that? I did... I just... She's a 13-year-old girl. Well, because girl. of the way he describes her in different parts of the book, I just assume she was older. Exactly. Oh, you mean when he's exactly. constantly talking about her tits? Yeah. Um, the way Dick describes like her that. and the way okay. Ted Barton Fine, David. is, when he's is physically breasts, attracted to her is oh, disgusting. Yeah, that, yeah it's, it's gross. And I'm not, I don't know, maybe I'm just being, Remember am that, I being? A, like, no, you're not being. Remember that line at the end where he's like, Maybe you could just be your old form, but a couple of years older. Gross! <laughs> it's so... It's just bad. Yeah. And I'm not I'm not the yeah, kind me. of person that uses creepy a lot for a lot of things, you know? <clears throat> you know, a guy standing on a corner is automatically creepy nowadays, but this is really creepy. It's... Yeah, it it was gross. I, I don't need the suntan oil. And because what is she, did, did you, so that leads to another question. Especially does, does due to even, the fact does, she's described as not having a woman's body, yet Ted is always like, hey, hey. yeah, you're, you're kind of cute. You, ugh, that's uh. gross. But here's the thing I needed, I, I needed clarification on because I, I don't know if maybe I'm just stupid. It's possible. But does she need to strip down and cover herself in suntan oil because doesn't she eat the golem? No, she eats a... Uh, she eats a like a bar of soap or something. I did not get that, but I me no you know, like it's a, this it's a scene. Spell. Not a fan of this scene. No, I thought that was over the top, just by her age. And even if you look at it in the context of the era it was written, it's still creepy. Yep. You know, I was just curious about what you how you guys felt about that. Oh yeah, it bothered me more than anything else in this book, David. I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and I think with that, do you, do you guys have anything else about the Cosmic Puppets you'd no, like there, to say? There's a, or a lot of we, little sections that were very good in this book. Or can we kind of wrap this up? Well, I did want to bring up there. There's a there's a very detailed review um, that's on that I read on one of the Philip K. Dick websites by a writer named Barb Morning Child, and she did some. She actually specifically talked about we had it's the, probably Bob Morning Child Barb yeah. Morning Child probably not Bob Barb Morning Child. It's Barb. <laughs> Barb this review Morning. was done by Barb Morning Child. <laughs> <laughs> you sound okay, like she, the guy from Grandma's Boy. She actually explains the Wanderers in there in a way that I thought was interesting, just because we talked about it. Um, uh, Dick depicts the conflict we. We experience between subjective and objective reality most clearly when Ted Barton first enters Millgate and found that his subjective memory was different from the, from the Millgate he experienced in object reality. The characters are continually faced with this dilemma, especially the Wanderers. They are outcast from Irahim's distortion and spend their lives trying to bring back the memory of their object reality. They have a lot of trouble living in the distortion. They must close their eyes to blot it out and count their steps. Wanderers represent the thought processes of our minds 
They are lost, confused, and distorted, but they are in search of blind void for absolute knowledge. I don't know, that's kind of an egghead <laughs> description, but I, I, it makes sense. You know, yeah. it's a it's a way to look at it. And yeah. you know how, how Dick thought, too, in, in general. It very well could have been what he had in mind. It just doesn't... It doesn't come across clearly enough to, or maybe because it's the shortened version of the book, it doesn't come across clearly enough for me to see that in the in the text itself. All right, so now we can talk about the end. I think the, the your end, favorite part. The end of this book is by far the dumbest moment in a Philip K. Dick book <laughs> I've seen yet, or a short story. Okay, it is so dumb. <laughs> um, it's so dumb. Is as offensive as all the 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 objectification of the thirteen year old young woman was. This is is equally objectifying and dumb, but it's more dumb than anything. <laughs> uh, so the the very last we got to find it. Let's read the last paragraph of one cosmic puppets. He was recalling a sleek, glowing body, a lith. Lilth shape, life, life <laughs> shape, diffusing itself in the moist soil of early morning. A flash of black hair and eyes as she trickled away from him into the earth, which was her home. Red lips, white teeth, a gleaming flicker of bare limbs, and then she was gone. Gone? Arm, uh, Arm, uh, Armantian wasn't gone. She was everywhere. In the trees, in the green fields, the lakes and forest lands, the fertile valleys, mountains, on all sides. She was below and around him. She filled up the whole world. She lived there, belonged there. Two swelling <laughs> mountains divided for the road ahead. Barton <laughs> passed slowly between them. Firm hills, rich and full, identical peaks glowing <laughs> warmly in the late <laughs> afternoon sun. Barton sighed. He'd be seeing reminders of her just about everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> My God! They drive yeah. between her breasts. And then the he breasts. backed up and he drove back through them and then he uh, backed up. And then that's <laughs> so dumb. So, this is exactly a scene from Naked Gun 2 and a half. <laughs> exactly. There's a scene in Naked Gun where, where uh, Frank Drevin's driving and he says... He's just broken up with his wife, and he says, everything I see reminds me of her. And then they show the San Nofre, like, uh, nuclear power plant that looks like two boobs. <coughs> and, like, that's the joke, is they just show that to the side. And and this might as well be the same thing. Right. Yeah, it's stupid as fuck. It's really dumb. It's dumb. Boob mountains. <laughs> Boob, Boob mountains. <laughs> yeah, dumb. All right. It ends on Boob mountains. I just like David saying it ends on Boob Mountains. <laughs> All right, so what about the movie that we're going to make out of oh, this one? Well, hold on. Oh, whoa, whoa, Larry, you're getting a little ahead of the game here. Let's, let, let's just go you around. You want to talk about Boob Mountains more? I'm going to give this two out of five Boob Mountains. <laughs> All right, Larry? Yeah, same. Two Boob Mountains. <laughs> David? Um... I'm going to give this two Zorastian gods. He just didn't want to say Boob Mountain. Again. Wow. I said it enough. I'm going to give it two Zorastian gods out of five. Wow, I think that's the first unanimous vote we've had on this show. Yeah, I think it is. You know what? I gave it four stars originally. Why? What? Because... Out of five? I I just... I had fun reading. I asked you if you were drunk, but I know the answer to that is no. I'm going to go back and edit my the, yeah, my initial reaction upon reading it is that this is the one that the more I thought about it, the less I liked it. So right. what I'm saying. The opposite World Jones made. Yeah, the more I read about World Jones made, the more I read about Japed, the more I liked it. With Cosmic Puppets, like, I think I was won over originally by all, like, the cool prose parts and the parts. And my imagination filled in a lot of gaps mm -hmm. and and changed a lot of things in my own head. And when I, by having to sit down and talk about it and do the research and read about it, like, I had to think more critically about the novel than I actually did when I was reading it. I just kind of, in, and remember, I read the first 80 pages without stopping and taking any notes. I was just kind right. of flowing with it. And, I and think, it does read that way. Throughout the whole book, it, yeah. it reads very cleanly 
and very quickly. Like prose wise, there's some really good stuff here, but uh, there's really good moments. It's just overall, it's it's a mess, and you cannot like seriously. That ending is so dumb and so bad. That's the last thing you read in the book. Yeah, and and I'm not the only person. We're not the only people that caught onto it because the whole boob mountain thing is like I saw at least two reviews on Goodreads where. people People were like, this is the dumbest thing what's he ever wrote. What's up with boob What's up with it? It <laughs> ends with driving between two giant boobs and, like, um, you know. Yeah. And, and, and like, no. Just no. Overall. Right. You think Dick patted himself on the back? He's, like, sitting there at his typewriter. Clack, 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 clack. And then, oh, I know. A real good joke. I'll drive through <laughs> some boobs. <laughs> Fill your genius. Well, I mean, who? This is the failure. I, <laughs> I definitely think he was on some serious shit when Calls he Calls himself Philly D. <laughs> Philly Dick. Philly K. Philly K. <laughs> Philly K, what were you thinking? Oh. I mean, I just, I just don't know what. I mean, in Ace, Don Wolheim. <laughs> Don Wolheim, what were you thinking? We right? got it. This is when you, when you, when you, when you, when you this is 1950 whatever so you get on the phone you tell the operator i need this number in berkeley california yeah uh phil we got to talk about this boob mountain thing <laughs> right but look at it at the time it was done they probably thought that was funny us yeah. now it's real real stupid yeah i don't th- no i don't think there was ever a time where i don't think they were going for humor though if he let i think he thought a 13 year old Covering herself in oil and rubbing it all over her body slide, then I imagine they're going to let Boob Mountain slide. Well, and I think he thought that this was, I bet, I, I totally, we think it's stupid, but I think he thought this was poetic. Right. And yeah. I think he thought it was. You know, Mother Nature and. It was beautiful, you know, like. Mountains, boobs, we get it. Kind of like, I think he was thinking this was like a beautiful he was like, a, Gaia a, Gaia, like, yeah. he, he felt Gaia! He, he, oh my God. he felt he was being a real Faulkner. Gaia! A real Faulkner. <laughs> yeah. I love you, Gaia! Oh my God, stop! Wow. No, I got, I get, that's actually an inside joke from, a, from some bunch of friends and I used to go on a um, camping trip every year. And David campfire stories. Well, but there was one time where we were all in our tents and like everyone had gone to sleep and one of our friends just out of nowhere, just, just everyone was quiet and almost asleep and he just went, Gaia! And we all started laughing. And so that's what made me think of it. But oh, anyways, that humor's on par with Boob Mountain. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you. Somebody out there is laughing and, and it's going to start yelling. And they're going to do it at their next camping trip. You Fair. watch. All right. Well, maybe it'll be a right. dickhead shirt. What what movie are we going to make out of this? So, I'm actually not going to make a movie out of this because... Bullshit, you got to make a movie because I, I was going to say that... I need you to calm the fuck down. Oh, whoa. <laughs> you got to make it's a movie. I'm heated. not saying I'm not going to make a movie Hot takes. because I don't think, personally, there's enough here to make a movie. But what I would say is that I would like to see this as, like, a Twilight Zone or an episode of The Outer Limits. Right. Oh, like a one hour. Like a one hour. Or even if they an- didn't. Like part didn't of a episode. one hour anthology show or something similar because I don't necessarily feel like this would be a very interesting movie and I don't really want to see Peter Jackson's The Cosmic Puppets. So. <laughs> I actually. They could do it as an episode on the. Uh, on a uh, Electric on Dreams. TV Electric show. Dreams. Yeah, yeah, Electric Dreams. Yeah. I actually. I think I. I think you could make a movie of this. Actually, of all the ones that we've read so far, it's funny. It's I gave it um, two Zoroastrian gods out of out of five, but I actually this is the one where my my brain is working a lot on. I think you could make a really cool movie yeah. out of this. There's a lot of really cool imagery. There's a lot there. What I think you would have to do in making this into a film is you would have to focus on um, you would. You would not be faithful to the novel. No, you, you not would, at all. No, you would have to. Ted Barton would need to have an arc. You'd have to have Peg be a real character. Right. You would, um, or just not have the wife at all. Yeah, there was no need for her. She's to be a, in the novel. She's a completely useless character. 
You know what you might want to do is kind of have like a Marty McFly thing where Ted Barton has like kind of a lost love or somebody who was a childhood crush, or a something? childhood crush who doesn't remember him, you know, um, right. Who, who he's kind of the, his reason for going back is to, or no, it, it's a totally different person because they all <laughs> changed when things happen. Like right, he her- finds that he's in love with that person. And then it turns out once the change goes back, that she's the girl he had a crush on as a kid. So there's a parallel there. Right. Yeah, yeah, you could do that. I think, like, having some kind of, like, um, kind of Marty McFly have to, like, kind of revive, like, maybe he lost something or somebody, or, like, a parent or somebody was left behind. Right. Um, where he has more of a motivation. And then... Um, and, and and to just put him in the middle of this cosmic battle in a way that, you know, gives him, like, a start-to-finish arc. Now, as far as, you know... Who directs it? Who directs it? Um, well, you know, if we had good enough script and, and you could do it, um, I would love to see the visual style of, like, a Fincher. Mm. Um, I mean, you would have to have the kind of script in order to justify it. Um, yeah. And I would, in the Ted Barton role, I might want to have, like, some kind of every guy with a little bit more charm, maybe, like... Brian Cranston. No. No, not that old. No, it'd have to be a younger... Yeah, like a Ryan Reynolds or a... Um... Yeah, any of those big superstar kind of guys, I think. Yeah. Would fit Lee this Marvin. role. <laughs> he did. <laughs> um... But, I mean, Fincher is kind of shooting for the sky, but if you, in a more realistic way, if you could get, um, like, a Brad Anderson with the right script. Right. I would love uh, Cosmic Puppets script with Brad Anderson bringing kind of a visual style to it, and that would be really, really cool. And, or, yeah, yeah, that's, that, that's how I would do. But I would actually love to adapt the Cosmic Puppets. Right. Almost because... You know what would almost make me want to do Cosmic Puppets more than some of the other ones is because of the things that you could fix. not Right, the things that are missing that you could add to the story. You could make, you could fix Cosmic Puppets in a a screenplay. I'm 100% behind Larry's suggestion. (laughs) You saw that, did you? I did. I mean, Um, I haven't seen the movie yet. 100%. Okay, so I, I agree with you, David, on the story and everything. That it's you know there, there's a lot of room here to make a good movie. And uh, even though I haven't seen this guy's movies yet, and I've only seen the trailer uh, for Mandy. Oh, it looks so good. But uh, Panos Cosmatos, who's this mostly guy, known for Beyond the Black Rainbow, yeah, just looks like the best director for a movie, a, a Phil K. Dick movie that has all these weird ass themes to it yeah i'm gonna get behind larry's suggestion having seen beyond the black rainbow and being super excited for mandy right i'm gonna say i would agree with larry on this his Um, visual style looks so good i want to say that when mandy comes out in theaters right now that i'm declaring that if anthony goes without me i'm gonna kick his fucking ass (laughs) (laughs) the movie looks that good right it looks that good it I watched that trailer way too many times. Yeah, that trailer looks fucking badass. So if you haven't seen it, folks out there, watch, uh, look up Mandy with starring Nicolas Cage. The trailer looks just crazy. Especially if you're if you're a fan of early '80s horror and Ralph Bakshi movies, heavy metal, you know all that kind of stuff. You're gonna mm-hmm. love this one. All right. Well, we. Well, do you do you want to add? So you're gonna back. I'm going to back Larry's suggestion, but I would prefer to see this as a, like a one-hour part of an anthology series. Right. But but I think that about does it. Good yeah, lord. For Cosmic Puppets. I think David's about to pass out. So you know what we're doing next time? What are we doing next time, David? We're doing... Uh, well, the next uh, episode is going to be the Adjustment Bureau. Adjustment Team. <laughs> adjustment Team slash Bureau. And the next book we're doing is... Eye in the Sky. Which I am super stoked for. I'm really excited to read this one. Yeah, me too. And the back copy reads, When a routine tour of a particle accelerator goes awry, 
Jack Hamilton and the rest of his tour group find themselves in a world ruled by Old Testament morality, where the smallest infraction can bring about a plague of locusts. Escape from that world is not the end, though, as they plunge into a communist dystopia in a world where everything is an enemy. Eye in the sky. This one looks looks like a really good book. It's all right. Haven't you started reading it, Larry? No, I haven't started oh, it. Oh, you just have a bookmark in the book. Yeah, I I've read it in. already. Oh, aren't you fucking cool? It's all right. <laughs> this is the last one, and then I'm finally... Oh, and then we're not, on the same level? Yeah, then we're on the same, same baseline, because I'm not rereading any more after this. Just right. in time for Do- Doctor of Futurity, which I've heard is... Futurity. Futurity. Wait, it's Eye in the Sky and then Time Out of Joint. Oh, is it Time Out of Joint next? No, no. No, no. No, 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 no. It's Doctor of Futurity. I'm going to look that up later. Anyway. I'm going to look it up right now. I've got it. Let's not do it on the podcast. I'm All doing right. it right now, <laughs> Anthony. Um, I'm tired. Eye in the Sky and then Time Out of Joint. Boom! Oh! Then Vulcan's Hammer. Then Dr. Futurity. I am right. Anthony is right. That's what's up. Okay. <laughs> fuck is that? That's so you I'm can right. find us on, on Twitter right and Facebook and well, Instagram. Twitter at what? Dickheads Pod. On Instagram, Dickheads Podcast. Facebook is just, again, Dickheads Podcast. Am I right, you guys? I think so. Yeah, we, David's out. You can find we me. We post on on um, what is that thing we post on our episodes on SoundCloud. SoundCloud. We post on SoundCloud and on YouTube. Someday iTunes will let us in their sandbox. Um, I'm still working on that. I swear <laughs> to fucking God, I'm trying. Yep, we've um, changed the name for the iTunes thing, but we'll see how that works out. Yeah, I gotta write them back, but um. Yeah, so, uh, and please let, let us know, um, some feedback because we're not hearing much. I hear little tiny trickles. I know. And we love it. Every time someone says something, we love it. Yeah. It's okay to say you don't like something. Cause we can. Especially if it's about Anthony. <laughs> Fuck you. Um. Thanks. <laughs> so, uh, Cosmic Puppets, um, let's put a fork in that shitty book. <laughs> and. <laughs> And I think we're looking at a good run here coming up. This is not the coming attractions part of the podcast. Let's go. All right. Keep being paranoid, everyone. Stay oh, paranoid. Oh, my God. We didn't even sign off right. <sighs> Keep it. Stay paranoid. Keep I it. I guess. Keep it. World. Keep paranoid. It. Paranoid. Bzz, bzz, bzz. <laughs> Cosmic battle. <laughs> <laughs>